Who was Jesus with Acharya S? Astrotheology, Christ myth theory, all these variety of ideas she had brought to the table. Brilliant woman. You're going to hear from some of her fans and some of the ideas surrounding how these affected our lives and our knowledge and our understanding of Jesus and all the gods, or at least the ones we understand. Hope you guys enjoy it. If you have something to contribute, go down in the comment section. Let us know your thoughts of Acharya S. DM Murdoch, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Your host, Derek Lambert. We are Myth Vision. Your host, Derek Lambert. Your other host, Dr. Luther G. Williams. We have Miguel Connor from Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio joining us today. How you doing, Miguel? Good. Glad to be on with you guys. Luther? Always a pleasure, Derek. How are you guys doing? Great. And we have Batman. Can we hear the voice of Batman for a second here? This is Batman. <laughs> and today's show is Who Was Jesus with Acharya S.? I just want to read something before we just rabbit trail. None of this is pre-planned. This is off the cuff. And Dorothy Milne Murdoch was born on March 27th, 1960. She died on December the 25th of 2015, the winter solstice. Better known by her pen names, Acharya S. Wow. and D.M. Murdoch, was an American writer supporting the Christ myth theory. Jesus ever existed as a historical person, but was rather a mingling of various pre-Christian myths, sun deities, dying and rising deities. Her last published book is Did Moses Exist? The Myth of the Israelite Lawgiver. She wrote and operated a website focused on history, religion, and spirituality, and astrotheology. She asserted the pre-Christian religious civilizations understood their myths as allegor allegorical, but Christians obliterated evidence by destroying, suppressing literature after they attained control of the Roman Empire, leading to widespread illiteracy in the ancient world. Ensuring the mythical nature of Christ's story was hidden, she argued the Christian canon, as well as its important figures, were based on Roman, Greek, Egyptian, and other culture, cultural myths. Her, her theories are variously received by mainstream scholars. For instance, Dr. Robert M. Price. He criticized her book at first and then praised her later. She also wrote against the ancient astronauts' theories and all sorts of ideas. She spoke in many languages and read in many languages. This woman was a scholar scholar. And I just want to introduce her as that. We hope to resurrect her spirit in this conversation. And I hope you guys stay tuned and enjoy the show. Whoever would like to start us off, I'm just here for the ride. So if you guys have something you'd like to say, please feel free to do so. Bueller? <laughs> no, I was just uh, <clears throat> thinking, looking at the... The Wikipedia article, and it's amazing that her book, Christ Conspiracy, came out in 1999. What a, It was a completely different world. And when I think about it, her work was not, it fueled so many different movements and opened so many doors. It, and the mythicist was just a small part of it, but it really helped. The, it fueled the free thought movement, the new atheist movement, the pagan movement. I think people, the, the UFO movement, when you would go to Cheria's forums back in those days, the early 2000s and so forth, it was a huge motley crew. I mean, it really was the big tent and scholars, again, pagans, ufologists, atheists, uh, open-minded Christians would all congregate there. So she was, I mean, she was a walking uh, Alexandria of ancient times. So it's amazing how cutting is what she did. And of course, how controversial it is because uh, sadly I was also thinking last night uh, you know the internet back then was very different it wasn't woke like it is today and I guess in a way it was better because uh, you didn't get these hordes of woke people trying to cancel you out when one person decided your idea was not popular but at the same time 
people could be really vicious to each other one on one. And sadly, Acharya definitely gave credence to the idea of, uh, uh, you know, Gamergate and the bro culture because her work was cruelly received, and there was uh, not it was it was received negatively. But a lot of even scholars and thinkers would attack her for being a woman which was completely out of line. I mean, they didn't attack her ideas, but they would attack her or they would just online in an article, uh, you know, throw insults at her. So she had a, a, it was a weird paradox. She had an uphill battle. She had all these amazing people that really gravitated to her work, but she also had to deal with attacks from fundamentalists, from atheists, because the uh, yeah, many in the new atheist movement hated the mythicist position because uh, for them it was important that there was a historical Jesus so they could uh, bring down his ideas and religion. If there was no historical Jesus, they kind of didn't have an argument either. <laughs> Nobody had an argument mm -hmm. unless you go into the, you know, the the myth, the metaphor, and all that that beauty that attracted me to Acharya was again the power of myth. I saw her very much uh, taking the torch of subthinkers as uh, Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung, when mythology is not just stories, but it really is. Uh, uh, the inner process of the human being and how we stand in the universe, how we can become transparent to the transcendent and uh, reach out and expand our consciousness out into whether the spiritual world or a better form of living and so forth. She really was a, a pioneer in so many ways. And uh, again, it's, uh, it's uh, a great light went out and she's definitely sorely missed, but it cannot be uh, overstated enough that she was a pioneer in so many ways. I don't think, uh, uh, I don't think the internet or religious studies or even culture would be the same without her, her work and her contribution. I agree. She was one of a kind. I mean, I had come to these positions without even knowing that she existed. And when I found her, someone introduced her to or her material to me. I was just blown away that somebody else believed like I did, you know. And so over the years, I became friends with her. Um, I actually like created the covers for her astro theology uh, calendars that she used to produce. And uh, I even did the cover for her last book before she passed away, the uh, Moses uh, book. And uh, she was just a very intelligent, smart. I mean, she was so smart. I, I just don't think her work gets the credit that she deserves. Uh, the, the number of citations and the number of of people that she consulted, and I mean experts in their field. And, uh, you know, I just feel that she gets so much criticism without people reading her material. And uh, I just wish that would change. Yeah, I mean, uh... That's when you're when you're a, a groundbreaking thinker. That's just going to happen. I mean, she was a, a trailblazer, and her idea she was uncompromising. She was aggressive. Her mind, um, again, is those people that uh, you fall in love with the way her mind works because they're always working things out, always looking for different uh, insights into scholarship, never resting and continuing going. Uh, I remember my first uh, encounter with Acharya was uh, years before I even read her book, sort of. I was, I think it was 1999 or around there and uh, Derek could relate. I had just gotten out of rehab or I'd been out of rehab. So I was in sort of the pink cloud mode <clears throat> and I was dating a, an Indian girl, beautiful Indian girl, uh, very smart. She was probably more secular at the time than she would have been Hindu. And she came by my apartment and, gave, and says, you've got to read this. And she, there was a stack of photocopied papers on the Christ conspiracy comparing Jesus to Horus and all that and the 12. And it blew my mind. I was like, this is it. This is where I need to be. And at the time, 
I was pretty much, I was sort of this fusion. I was a practicing Catholic who would go to church on Sundays, but I was also really into Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism. So I would go to like the Buddhist temple on Wednesday. So I was pretty open-minded, <laughs> but these ideas, for some reason, I found it's, it's oddly, you would think that I would have found it sort of, uh, I would have rejected them or felt uncomfortable when you get a new idea that goes against the religion you were raised for most of your life back then 30 years of my life but it felt just so natural because again it really opened up the power of myth and the whole lattice the beautiful mosaic that is religion and religious studies across the world that jesus would have so many parallels to horus to uh, krishna to buddha and it was incredible and then years later uh probably about five years later i bought the christ conspiracy and I think I sat down for six hours at a coffee shop in Chicago and read the entire thing. I, I emailed her. I had already later I'd started my podcast and she was one of my first guests. I emailed her and I said, I love your work. Mm -hmm. And she was just so kind and down to earth. She gave me like two interviews in a row. I'm sure uh, you guys know it's always great when you get started and you always remember those scholars or bestseller writers who are so down to earth, so casual that they're like, sure, let's have a conversation now because <laughs> I'm great. That's what I got about it, Cherry. It wasn't like I have all this knowledge and, and I want, and this is that I enjoy talking about this with anybody who wants to have an intelligent, engaging conversation. And that was so great. And she was a guest for many years. And then we started, we would talk on the phone and, correspond and we became friends and it was a it was a great experience she was awesome i mean uh just listening to her if if she was still alive today me and luther would obviously be fighting you miguel over who's getting her for the next show uh because she was that good uh i mean she did a good what i like to call she was a bridge between new age mythicism and atheistic myth mythicism and really you couldn't put your finger on her at one moment she sounded atheistic and then the next moment she sounded new agey and you're like this woman's too good to be true like the world can't keep this woman and this is why she's not here today i like to think because uh you know it was hard to, it's hard to tell exactly where she was she wouldn't come out public and say what i believe doesn't matter she says that very openly it really doesn't matter look at my work look at what it says it speaks for itself and me and luther really were influenced by that batman i'll edit that who's that <laughs> who's who's that guy you just mentioned i've never heard of him batman <laughs> oh, these oh, are oh, not okay. the droids you're looking for batman. <laughs> <laughs> oh i'll edit this so but his um, name is on the thing Everybody's yeah gonna... i'm gonna slap a picture over that oh, okay, okay okay yeah i'll cut it and i'll make All sure right. i send you a copy but um yeah patch, you, patch that roof don't don't leave any of it unrepaired <laughs> i wanted to ask you guys if we could take this from <laughs> the work that she did right that what we're doing is right now we're kind of just giving our our heartfelt you know toward what she did let's talk about some ideas on mythicism that she brought to the table um some of the sun deity concepts the astro theology stuff if we can talk about some of these ideas and just have a little fun and some of our audience may not have heard of these ideas so i don't know if you'd like to start us out luther or batman or miguel it doesn't matter i just want to hear some astro theology stuff and think that you heard that she taught that made you go ooh, because i well, be the same way yeah well before we get into the specifics let me say i was tremendously influenced by her but too late to have known her personally and so at the time, I had a background in esoteric research in the Bible for about a decade, and I became familiar with her writings. And immediately, I was thinking along the lines of her work as a synthesis of the various types of, of esotericism is what I wanted to do. And then she also was a great synthesizing influence, as, as Miguel pointed out, and as Batman did too. So um, I... I I was more committed than ever after reading The Christ Conspiracy and a few other of her articles to ground the esoterics that I was doing in theoretical perspectives. And so uh, I did that, whether we're talking about uh, 
onomatology, the study of the meaning of names or celestial imagery or uh, gematria, which is which is really my specialty and the main thrust. All that really came from her and, and most recently Roman provenance theory. And so she sat down shortly before she died, uh, our viewers may be aware, with Joe Atwell and talked about <laughs> the some possible uh, lines of confluence uh, between uh, a, uh, New Age mythicism and Roman provenance theory. Well, I heard that and I believe that that's a, a very important direction for the research uh, to follow. And so I committed myself to really continuing her work in that area. And so uh, right now I'm, I'm working assiduously in connecting esoterics with various theoretical perspectives and most notably Roman provenance theory that's reflected in the brand new book that I have coming out and, uh, and her work, her open-mindedness and, and the thoroughness of her scholarship is uh, indispensable in the kind of things that I'm doing. So, and, and I let Joe Atwell know that he actually sat down uh, with her, but uh, it's so important for this kind of scholarship and this kind of perspective uh, to be present in our world today. You know, since, um, oh, I guess for the past five years, uh, most definitely, you know, we've had things like, you know, the election of a populist president in the United States, the Great Britain, the people of Great Britain deciding to leave the European Union. And so there's this rise of populism. And so I think uh, Acharya's thrust in that really anticipated this kind of movement in the area of scholarship, because now scholars are asking questions which, which were never asked before, and not just the questions themselves, but the motivations for those questions. And, uh, and of course, then you look at what makes, those, what makes asking those questions possible or profitable. So you talk about even funding sources, are they available? Because every area that scholars go into, there has to be some impetus in order to launch it and to sustain it. And Acharya was brave enough to tackle a lot of these areas, and that's why some call her a pseudo-scholar. She's not a real scholar. But if you listen to the super scholars, like Dr. Robert Price, who we've had many times on the show, uh, he doesn't question at all her scholarship and in fact considers it to be so immense and her legacy to be so complex that no scholars have, have exhibited that kind of breadth. And even he himself has said, boy, if I had to tackle the kind of the kind of information that uh, Charya was used to dealing with, I don't know if I could do it. So I think now the kinds of questions that we're beginning to ask in the research, it's reflective of the age in which we live. Uh, we are studying the motivations behind scholarship. We're asking the why questions and the who questions. Those are the ones uh, that prompted the meetings between Acharya and Joseph Atwill. Those are the kinds of meetings that are reflected in my writings now. And so when you talk about Roman provenance and you know, uh, why, what are we actually seeing here? What's the politics that's behind it? She shot the arrow pointing toward all these things. And so I'm very grateful for her work. Well, Luther, if you don't mind me piggybacking off that, two things real quick before we jump into details. I'm sure we all, we could literally do a show only on how magnificent she truly was. And I mean, wouldn't hurt me, none. You know, this, this is just, uh, she's such an awesome person. But um, I've heard personally firsthand, and I know Dr. Price does not mind me sharing this information, he's supposed to do the, the follow-up Christ conspiracy, the second book, to complete it on her behalf because she's not with us anymore. He told me, and I'm asking about astrotheology over and over with him, and he was like, she was looking at so many sources, so many things, he said that he himself could not complete the second Christ conspiracy. He had to send it to someone else that he knew had a vast understanding of this, this world of literature that is astrotheological and mythological in nature to tell you these celestial stories and myths in a way that he has never looked at them. So it was way overwhelming to him to be able to really get all that. And number two, I was detoxing on a couch as a fundamentalist preterist believer and turned on this video that had this weird image with 12 signs and it was called zeitgeist. And I was like, hold on. I sat down for a few hours. Now, mind you, I didn't know how accurate or inaccurate. Don't really care at this moment. 
I'm watching something that made me look at Jesus in a whole new way. I had never thought, is Jesus, he, there was no comparison to Jesus. Even if there is some, as a fundamentalist Christian, we're taught, and as a Christian period, there are no real comparisons to Jesus. I mean, Mahatma Gandhi, yeah, he might've been a nice guy. Buddha, yeah, he might've been cool. Jesus, there's nothing that compares to Jesus. I mean, we got songs like that, you know, nothing compares, you know, all the Christian songs that are in church and stuff that sing these things, nothing compares to you, right? Well, this video showed me that there were things that compared to it, even though skeptics come on and go, eh, they over parallel this, this, that, blah, blah, blah. I didn't care. There was enough for me to see and go, okay, I need to start treating Jesus like I do any other deity. At this point, I need to consider, is there more of a connection between why he exists and looks like he does and why these others look like they do? And that's when my whole world as a Christian no longer was Christian. It was humanity. That's what Acharya taught me. She taught me to not be a Christian, but to be a human, a human being in this world with other humans and how to love you for whatever your tradition is. You're a Buddhist, you're a Muslim, you're this – Okay, we all have tradition, but let, let's go to the bone, the very frat fabric of all foundations to everything we all hold sacred, and there you'll find something celestial in nature. That's great. That's awesome. Wonderful. Inspirational stuff, brother. Yes, all humans, all the same. Well, uh, we all share the same stories, the same archetypes, same archetypal images. So uh, I think that was uh, that was our passion as much as it's my passion and those people here is that commonality, those uh, that source material, where do we come from and uh, what we can share, the struggles, the visions, uh, the dreams that we share as a person. I mean, what did, uh, was it Carl Jung or Campbell said? Um, Myth is a public dream, and uh, dreams are private myths. This is uh, wh this is where we stand. I mean, uh, there is uh, that line from uh, the Terry Pratchett novel. Uh, um, there's the death character, and the, the the lady asking, "Well, humans, do do we need to believe in fantasies to cope with reality?" And he, and death goes, "No, you need to believe in fantasies to be human. You have no choice." And she's like, "Well, why do we get delusional?" And she said, and death goes, uh, you need to believe in things that aren't true. How else may they, how else can they become? And it is true. I mean, uh, imagination, inspiration. Uh, what did William Blake, what was uh, invented today was imagined yesterday. So, and, and these stories, these ancient myths fueled us. I mean, if we didn't have the myth of Icarus, would the airplane be invented? Who knows? But that story was, again, it was a thrust. It's behind us uh, to go to the moon to uh to find diseases to i mean so much is dependent on these ancient myths from all over the world that it really fuels but i'm yeah i'm sort of getting into <laughs> i'm taking from derek's like inspirational speech about how things are and i should say too um uh, i know we're supposed to be talking about the solar parallels but one other she was a very open-minded person she had visions she had insights but she got criticized a lot in Christ Conspiracy because there were sections about John Allegro and the mushroom, that Jesus was a mushroom. There was things maybe about aliens, about how there's salt on the pyramids. But what I, I didn't see her as sort of new agey. What I saw is she was basically just said, look, uh, everything you believed in as a Judo Christian is false. So let's speculate on a few more things and she was just putting it out let's speculate on this let's speculate she wasn't committing to anything i mean the only thing she was 100 percent committed to was jesus was the son i mean you could see that uh you could see that going but everything else was a speculation and she would uh she would uh, yeah she would modify her arguments uh I remember we did one show and asked her, well, are the Anunnaki aliens? And she's like, no, I have, I was open-minded about it. I did the research. I looked at the source material, the language. I realized 
there is no chance. Of course, she got blowback because then she would show me all these people unsubscribing from her, from her website. <laughs> oh, <God>. The ufologists <laughs> were furious at her because, no, the Anunnaki are aliens. But uh, she, she took everything on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. And again, she was very open-minded. I know uh, later on, she, towards I met her, she suddenly... Uh, her big issue was Islam. She decided that Islam was bad. She, she had somehow drank the apocalypse bug and thought that by now we would all be under Sharia law and all this other stuff. But that was she had decided that's one one route she was going to go. And I think Luther was talking about well, we have these uh, <clears throat> we have this populist uh, president and all that, and I always go and I always think, I wonder what a chair would have thought about Trump. She would have thought he was a <laughs> vulgarian, ignorant guy, but she also believed in strong borders. I mean, she, you couldn't put her in a, you couldn't pigeonhole. She kind of took every issue by issue and never dismissed any person just out of hand. It's, this person believes in this. So she would agree with a lot of conservatives and she would agree with a lot of liberals on a lot of issues. There was no way she would. Um, I agree with that, like Miguel. Pigeonholer. Yeah. You know, she, yeah, she was just about Im impossible to, if you try to pigeonhole her, you, you know, you'd be frustrated in the attempt just a little while up the line. Uh, I think about this term Christian that Derek spoke so eloquently about, you know, do, do we, do we really know what a Christian or an anointed one or a messianic, what those things really mean? We're still trying to discover that. We're still trying to discover what all this means about us. And I think ultimately Acharya helped us learn about ourselves. Uh, how, do we, how do we reconcile the human and the divine? What does that mean? The urging of man towards the divine and what does it teach us about ourselves? And I think we're still learning. I don't know what to call it because as we, uh, as we discover these things, there is the urge to label them. I think that's not just scholarly, that's human. And so, you know, you can't call it Christian because it's bigger than that. Uh, or or you, maybe you can if you desire to hijack the term from orthodoxy and say, well, I'm going to use it in a different way. And then that has its own uh, problems. But I think she put us on this great path towards self-discovery. And she's going to be recognized as one of the major figures uh, to to launch that effort. Yeah. And I, I think or, or to continue important it. is... Uh, she she told us to again look at the stars i mean because part of her thesis was that all these biblical characters all these ancient figures across time are based on the processes of the star and the zodiac and the movement of the universe which is something scholarship has basically completely forgotten and you guys we both had uh, john lundwall who basically says he's 100 percent right robert price agrees i mean how can you be a scholar of religion and not know astronomy? If you don't know astronomy, you're probably wasting your time because that is how the ancients talked about, as above, so below, the theory of correspondence. There was really no separation between the process of the stars and who we were. I mean, the, the sky was like the internet. It was our, the Wikipedia. It was the television. It was uh, the place where you documented your stories all at once. It was like Google, but cooler, right? And that's how the ancients thought. And scholarship got, well, not lost. It just evolved into linear thought, into a historical thought, and completely forgot how the ancients did. And, I mean, scholars have admitted that most things like uh, the, the Gospels or Thunder the Perfect Mind in the Nag Hammadi Library and all this, these things were never just read because nobody read in ancient times. It's illogical that people would sit there and read these things, only maybe less than 1%. So these things were performed out in plays, uh, in, uh, under the stars, different times of years to really you know, take effect on the followers and get people interested and so they could relate to the times of the year and the stars <clears throat> as a mnemonic device. So Echerio really brought this back, and I mean by brought it back, because as you guys have probably heard, in the, the Founding Fathers, Napoleon, uh, this uh, Martin Luther King Jr. talked about the similarities of Jesus and Mithras in a lot of his papers. This was in the air, it was normal, and in the last generation, 
everybody forgot about it slowly in this amnesia and it chair really brought it to the forefront and uh, hopefully people won't forget i know it's hard to look at the stars because <laughs> so much pollution that <laughs> we've all uh <laughs> screwed things up and nobody wants to get a telescope I, we just bought our son a, a telescope so hopefully we can get him to look at the stars so you know why read the bible i'll tell my son it's all up there man so it, it, I find <laughs> you know it, oh go ahead go ahead batman yeah, I was going to say, you know, it's funny, Miguel, that you bring that up about the stars, because when I was growing up, I was 16 years old, and Star Wars came out. And probably the greatest myth of our generation. And uh, it influenced my life so much. I I remember paying over 40 times to see the movie as a kid. I went to the theater that many times, and I, after that, I lost count. I remember sneaking in a, a tape recorder under my coat, and I would even tape the dialogue, so my brother and I, we would recite it at night. And I knew that I wanted to get in that industry. I had never seen any movie like that before. And so I became a student of Joseph Campbell because of George Lucas's uh, influence by him. And uh, so I was never able to go to film school or, or move out to California, uh, what I wanted to do. So the next best thing was I, I became a senior designer for a company that's, that's known all across the world for uh, the movies and, and entertainment that it provides. And uh, I, I got to meet my dream. I actually worked with George Lucas. I worked with oh. Jim Henson and the Muppets, uh, several of those individuals, but it was, it was George Lucas who really inspired me. And then of course, uh, being a student of Joseph Campbell, you know, and, and growing up as a kid, I loved the classics. I loved Homer and I loved, uh, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey and I loved, Jason and the Argonauts and, you know, all of those King Arthur and Excalibur. I loved, you know, those things growing up. And so Acharya and I had a lot in common and we would discuss these things and we both felt like, Oh, what kids are missing out on today, you know? And then, but it was those things that helped me put it all together that these stories were what Joseph Campbell discovered as the hero's journey. And so we looked at that and they're all similar. Everything's similar. All these stories are so similar. They're, the names of the major characters maybe have changed, but essentially they're telling the same things. I mean, here you have Luke Skywalker, you know, Skywalker is the sun, you know, and you have the dark side of the, the Darth Vader and the Sith representing the night and, and these, but these are all ancient stories. We do this with the matrix. Uh, you know, you can just about pick any movie out today, but Achari and I would discuss these things and say, it all goes back to the stars. It's, it's solar and, and lunar theology made in story form. And that's really the bottom line. We see that in national flags. Flags across the world have sun, moon, or stars on them. Um, you know, when you talk about Japan, it's the land of the rising sun, right? Um, all, of these, all of these stories have commonalities, and it's those commonalities, I think, that is what makes us human. And that's what she was really all about. I agree. 100%. Mm -hmm, for sure. That's a, that's very interesting. And you brought that to my take, to my, uh, to my thinking five, six years ago. And I thought, Oh man, this is hard to swallow, but it was so freeing because you know, I was trapped. I was inside of a very, very isolated box in the way that I thought, I thought I was right. I had this notion that I had to know, like I had to know everything and be right. And when I started to uncover this stuff, I realized the vastness and 
who knows how far back now that we're uncovering places like the Glebeki Tepe and, and who knows what's older than that, that we haven't discovered that might have some type of celestial root to it. It's like, whoa, I'll never know. I'll never know at all. So it was very freeing to know up front. I will never know it all. And I thought I had to know it all. It was like a weird, I don't know. My Christianity was kind of Gnostic in nature. Like I had to be the one who knew, you know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, you know, it was kind of Gnostic. Yeah, I'm plugging Miguel here a little, you know, but I mean, nonetheless. You were, you were elite. Stuck up elite. <laughs> I was an elite. <laughs> well, that's a fact. I was I was yeah. definitely Calvinistic, ask Luther, and, you know, oh, already I'm Calvinist. The, yeah, you I could was, never pass up a debate, Derek, and I don't mean to embarrass you. But no, on, I couldn't. <laughs> I was like, let me show you from the text and blah, blah, blah. And then you guys literally came by and said, hey, you know that rug you're standing on? <laughs> And I, it's, I'm on my back now looking up and you're like, you see those stars up there now? Guess what? All along, baby, you had no clue. So then I saw the sun, the son of God. He cometh on the clouds and every eye shall see him, the light of the world. And I said, is that just spiritual light? I used to think this is just spiritual. This is just this and that. He comes on the clouds. I mean, I remember watching Dragon Ball Z. I remember Goku would ride on this little, <laughs> you know, small cloud. And I'd be like, that Jesus surfing on the clouds don't, ah, don't make sense. Then I realized, well, this is apocalyptic literature. At least that's what we're told is apocalyptic literature. God comes on the clouds. That's judgment, which it does mean that in the Old Testament, according to the story. But who else rides on the clouds? Who else is the son of God or the light of the world? And they always make a big fuss about sun and the sun not being the same word. I get it, but there's many other details that made me say, you know what? He is that light figure. He is the sun in some sense. And then, you know, these ideas made me open up my mind. Like, what is going on? What is going on? Moses. Scholarship, it's a universal consensus at this point. If you're a critical scholar that isn't a believer, Dr. Price told me very clearly all the Old Testament or Hebrew scripture, critical scholars who don't believe are unanimous in saying Moses did not exist unanimous was that common 30 years ago i don't know how common that was well I'm before thomas sell thompson uh, yeah i, I, I wouldn't be surprised right? if he did i'm sort of leaning that he might have existed now Who, but there was an, yeah there might have been obviously an astrological thing to it but uh, when you read the work of gary greenberg and others he might have been a historical and even the ancients did. There was, there was, but anyway, that's a completely different discussion. Right. Now, do you I like to keep different on, arguments. Yeah, could he, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Could he be based on a historical, like Jesus, the Jesus character? So many people are like, he exists. I think, and I like to think, historicists are finding evidence of historical elements of a historical Jesus based off other things, like three men dying on the cross, two thieves, and Jesus crucified. Well, if there's anything historical we can know, they'd say he was crucified. Even like Paul says, if there's anything in our faith, he had to rise from the dead or everything's in vain. I tend to think these narratives are taken from Josephus. So if there was a historical Jesus, Ben Ananias, let's say, saying, woe to you, Israel, woe to you, scribes, all they did is they took a historical guy over here and put him onto a narrative in the 30s under Pontius Pilate claiming a prediction of the temple's destruction. So I wonder if the same could be said of like Moses. Moses might be based off of some Egyptian guy or some person that may exist in another narrative and not actually a Hebrew Israelite that, that really existed around that time. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that there couldn't be a root there, but does that mean that Jesus himself actually existed? And this is where we get into the weird stuff of nomatology and the names and the sequences. And like, at what point do we stop and go, ah, I can't. Hey, find- Derek, that stuff's not so weird, though. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not calling I mean, you a I, weirdo. Oh, OK. I thought you were, I thought you were making it personal. No, no, I'm, o- I'm only kidding. But I mean, what is the value in finding the historical Jesus? I think if we step back, we have to ask, what is it that we expect to find? What does it do for us to have a historical Jesus? Is there some sort of a deep-seated human need? Uh, Would he be something like a theological security blanket, to take the peanuts metaphor? You know, if we we found him, and how important would he be in actual practice? 
uh, do we need to somehow keep him in mind just beyond the curtain so that, you know, we have him? I mean, the historical Jesus is not the liturgical Jesus. You can be a worshiper, you can be a believer, you can even be a fundamentalist. They don't need historical Jesuses. That's why they may not refer to him. And yet, there's something, I don't know, something attractive, maybe even inherently satisfying as a human to know that such a figure existed. And I can't discount that. So I certainly like Miguel, keep an open mind about it. Although Derek, you and I talked about this. Uh, I recently constructed for the book, a timeline of Christianity. And I call this timeline Christianity light. Okay. And what's missing from it conspicuously is Jesus. I've got all these causes and motivations and all these agents, and it's a Christianity timeline without Christ. And it works just fine. The more details I plug into it, the more I'm able to understand movements and motivations without the need for a historical Jesus figure. So I'm still exploring it. Let's see how it goes. Good luck. As, uh, well, as Robert Price says, until, <clears throat> until we build a TARDIS, a time machine, we're going to speculate. I am pretty confident we're not going to find uh, any some, something close to a historical Jesus or person, but I'm no longer, again, it's never been my dogma or anything I worry too much about. Honestly, I would put mythicism as my first. And if I had a second place, it would probably be Jesus the Magician. I think that would be the second strongest. I think it's... <clears throat> pretty obvious he was a badass magic user who had to go because you know it's more of a dungeon and dragon you know there's the stars and then there's dungeons and dragons in science fiction that's it lord of the rings so it works perfect with my worldview and everything else but that's what what albert schweitzer said in the quest for the historical jesus whenever we go looking for a historical jesus we end up with the jesus we want somehow we find right. that works perfectly for our worldview and Maybe this is a supernatural, right? We search for Jesus. We're going to find the kind of Jesus that needs to work to help our, our lives or fit into our worldview or challenges or something like that. So and Miguel, you know, fine. nobody gave it nobody gave it more of a fair shot than Acharya, right? Oh I mean, she God, called yeah. it she she called it peeling back the onion. Remember, she used to use that metaphor, <laughs> and she says, "I can peel it back as far back as, as possible." And then I found there was nothing there. Right, and, and, I, and like, she would wow. take it far. I mean, she went not just the onion, but the whole uh, farm or uh, yard because, no, no, I was well. We have John the Baptist. Nope, no historical. Well, Mary Magdalene. Nope, no, 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 no. I think there was only Pontius Pilate left, you know, in the chariot <laughs> system, and he might be. He needs to walk carefully, but uh, that was it. And same with all the other history. I don't think Paul. I mean, I think she thought. Paul might have been a Polonius of Tyan or a, a, a mosaic of different characters. Uh, so it was, uh, she, she was uncompromising, but like you said, she could back it up with plenty of citations, arguments and everything else. It wasn't going to change, but yeah, apostles, Mary Magdalene, all these people, complete fictions based on the processes of the stars, Virgin Mary, you name it. I just did an interview with Rabbi Tobia Singer and uh rabbi was pointing out, trying to take the approach of, uh, how embarrassment, the argument from embarrassment. And he says that pretty much the argument from embarrassment makes sense of why Paul exists. And he's really arguing with other church members and, you know, he's not a liar and this and this and that. And, and I remember reading Batman's paper and Batman reminded me of Paul looking a lot like Balaam, the false prophet in the old Testament. And I thought to myself, well, Rabbi Toby Singer's got a point about this embarrassment thing, but, where else can I find this argument from embarrassment? Aha, Balaam. I mean, the book tells us that he was a prophet of God who somehow is telling people that these things are going to happen. And then the story has to answer, well, the reason Balaam got it wrong is that God sent a lying spirit into his mouth. So technically, he's actually not telling the truth that God himself put the lying spirit in Balaam's mouth. Then, of course, you have do talking donkeys and stuff, which... You could take that literal and argue with fundamentalists all day and bash the book, or you could say, what is this donkey? Or like Elijah, the bald, you're bald, 42 children get mauled by a bear. Yeah. Ooh, I mean, nasty. Are we going to bash the Bible all day long or say, let's see what this really is trying to say? I mean, 
is this not celestial? Is this Ursa major or minor? Is this not yeah. something going on? And that's what I think our passion is here at Myth Vision. I know that's your passion too at Aeon by Gnostic Radio. Our passion isn't to bash the book. We are obviously going to, you know, chuckle a little at fundamentalism and let them know like, hey, you guys are playing with out of your league with this text and you're really like doing something hocus pocus with it that had nothing to do with the original context. But we are trying to get to what it's really saying, what's really going on. I think when someone says, what's the importance of did Jesus exist or did these guys actually exist? To me, it's important to me, not just be for practice, practical person, purpose, Remember now, guys, I'm an elitist, so I have to know. <laughs> but no, regardless, it's, it's a matter of, uh, for me, it's a matter of going, how can we have 2 billion plus people in this world who literally create walls on people outside? Not all of them, by the way. I'm just giving a big number here create walls separating themselves from the rest of humanity. If what Acharya S is doing is correct, and she's pointing this stuff out, this is so groundbreaking. This is the precipice of humanity's complete change if we went in this direction. We would no longer have the divisions we have between race, co our culture. All these things could really change. This is just the birth of something like that. So to me, that's why I, I am fascinated over whether or not Jesus existed or not for the sake of humanity's future. If there is a man who did exist, this debate will never end because this guy, and I'm not saying this means he did or didn't exist. I'm just saying this guy existed. Now it's, did he really rise from the dead? And it's always going to be that. But if we can show enough reason why this guy's celestial, he didn't really exist. There is, it's all mythological that I think takes away all the fangs. And at the end of the day, more people will start to say, Jesus is Horus, is Osiris, is Dionysus, is Mithras, is what the heck is going on? That's my opinion. Yeah, that's why I liked uh, Dr. Price's statement when he said, uh, you know, if, if, if Superman didn't exist, which what we're, that's what we're comparing Jesus to, is the celestial Superman. If he didn't exist, then does Clark Kent exist? If he did, if, if if Superman didn't exist, then did Clark Kent not exist? And that's the bottom line for me: is that if we found a guy, would it really matter? Because he's just a guy. I mean, I. I take the position that all of these things are mythological stories and like Acharya, I, when I say myth, I don't mean that these are fictional non-meaning stories, but they're full of meaning and they contain cultural uh, importances uh, that, that, that make these myths important uh you know i i try to think agriculture to me the discovery of ag agriculture was probably the single greatest discovery since we found the atom bomb i mean it changed the world understanding agriculture and to see these stories preserve that information throughout the Bible in a celestial understanding is life and death for those people. You know, these were hunter gatherers at one point and now they're going into understanding, Hey, this is the time of year that we can plant. Oh, this is the time of year that we can harvest that. And by doing that, they could sustain great, cities and people could stay together and to me that was really really important information so to put these this information to story form so that children could understand them later and be easy to remember it preserves that information uh, and I think we've kind of lost sight of that um, and Acharya and I would discuss 
these things. Uh, I had uh, I have a theory that that all of these stories have a central character, which is the sun, the S U N, and each of these. Uh, stories also have a sub character. Uh, so, for instance, Adam represents the sun and Eve is Virgo. So it's the sun in Virgo. Uh, you know, Noah, his grandfather Enoch, who lived 365 uh, years. Old. Right. We, we know that's the solar revolution around the earth. So Enoch represents the sun, but Noah is that water man. He's Aquarius, the water man. And these are constellations. I think the boat or the, that, that Noah rode on was the Argo Navis, the night sky boat. Uh, Columba the dove is part of that story. Corvus the crow is the raven. Um, and then you look at David, uh, King David, you know, he remember the whole Goliath story when he kills Goliath with a sling and then he cuts the head off of of Goliath with his sword and holds his head up high before the children of Israel. Well, this is the constellation we know as Perseus. And we know the Greek story, Perseus slays the Medusa and holds her head up high to display before the Kraken and turn the Kraken into stone. And, and uh, Jacob and Esau are the Gemini twins. And their father Isaac is the son in the story. Moses, the lawgiver, he is the son in Libra, the scales of justice. He's also the son in the bull, uh, the destruction of the bull story, Taurus the bull. Um, Jonah is the fish story, right? Jonah's the son. Uh, Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel is the son in Leo the lion. So these are all preservations of ancient mythological stories, but they're they're set to seasons and knowledge of those seasons. And there's a lot of hidden detail in each one of these stories. And they're repeated in the New Testament. So instead of Eve being Virgo, who's the virgin in the New Testament? It's it's Mary. You know, the son in Mary in, in Virgo. Uh, you have the new water man who takes the place of Noah is John the Baptist. He's the new water man, right? And you even see the dove in the story where when he's baptized in the River Jordan the dove descends upon Jesus, right? Uh, James and John, the Gemini twins. I mean, so this just continues on in the New Testament, repeating these stories. So what's happened is in the Old Testament, you had a multiplicity of sun stories. But in the New Testament, you had a singular sun story, but with all the characters from the old Testament. And so this is a new story. It's like and they so tried I, to master, like they mastered all the old and right. And that's why, why you see, you see them taking from the old Testament. Yeah. Dr. See, Bob like says that's his number one mythicist point. And, and this is actually going to be in his book that's coming out soon. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Batman. I just figured right. this is a perfect point to bring up and he's coming at it. I've had sit down conversations in his living room. I'm like, Dr. Bob, think astro theology with me. Like I want him to think like what we're thinking right now. I think we're all on the same page and seeing what we're seeing together here. We all agree. He's like seeing the textual like details and he's going, ah, that's borrowing from Deuteronomy, Exodus, this. He's looking right. at it textually as a critical scholar and he's finding the story rewritten. And that's his number one argument on why these guys didn't exist is he finds practically the whole new Testament practically is all just a rewrite. And you're absolutely correct, Batman, that this new Testament is a single sun story collectively discussing all the different celestial signs and 
the sun traveling through their houses. And to me, that was interesting that you see little elements of that. Like he says, as in the days of Noah, well, we know that they were in the last days, according to the new Testament. Well, as in the days of Noah, come on, that was the flood, right? Well, who's the water man? John the Baptist is bringing the flood by him appearing. This idea of the flood is the beginning of the end right here in the new Testament. So there's this interesting celestial uh, motif. And you said something, and I'll shut up after this. I think this is valid. I was watching a debate between Dr. Baum and William Lane Craig. They say, Christians say, the number one apologist for Christianity in the world. I know Catholics who literally say William Lane Craig, Craig is like the top apologist in the world for Christianity. The one part that I bit my tongue when I heard the debate that I wish Dr. Baum would have known what we're talking about here or would have drove home. He said, the problem with you saying dying and rising gods compared to Jesus is that you're saying, and the New Testament is not an agricultural mythology like other agricultural mythologies. He drove home historicity as his point, and his point that couldn't go any further, and most scholarship just accepts, because why? There's a tidal wave of historicity from the church that is always taught, oh, this is a historical character, these are actual facts. I see agricultural mythology throughout not only the old but into the new with all the parables and all the stories that Jesus is telling about the harvest and reaping and the wheat and the chaff and you name it. This is agricultural mythology at its best, but you need to know how to look at it. If Dr. Bob would have drove that home, I think dying and rising God comparisons right in the face of someone like William Lane Craig could have fallen to his face right there if he had – an understanding like Acharya S does on these models. She'd have probably said, sorry, dude, this is agricultural. And let me give you the reason why, buddy. So sit down, you know, <laughs> I'm yeah, going to sit and, down now. And, and you know, Derek, I, I watch almost all of your shows, you know, the myth, myth vision podcasts. And it's funny, almost every show we get into these discussions, you know, whether it be Paul is this person or that person, or did he exist or didn't he exist or, you know, or whatever the show is, I notice always there are comparisons to Apollo or to Mithras or Dionysus or it's almost every show. And, I'm, and it's like this dancing elephant that's in the room. That's like, uh, geez, maybe none of them existed, and they're all mythological characters. Could it be? You know, <laughs> because we don't That's know, question, but I'm it? telling you, <laughs> if I can put this all together as a, a and demonstrate the Zodiac and them following this through their culture, in these stories, in my opinion, they cannot be historical. They just cannot be. And w when you add on top of that all of the fantastic things, you know, Jesus fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes or what, you know what I'm saying? These are, the, this is the fantastic part of it. And, and it, it, to me, it should say, okay, look, we shouldn't look at this as history. We should look at this as what it's trying to teach us, you know, from either an agricultural aspect or an astrological aspect or whatever it is. Um, you know, it's like, uh, what was it in 1973, I think? No, 72. It was uh, a book called The City of Revelation. John Mitchell, John showed, Mitchell. <laughs> yeah, right. showed how the 153 fish story is a geometry lesson. And it's, it's incredible the detail of that geometry lesson. And yeah, yet we use in the myth of Pythagoras too. Yeah. And, and the thing is that look at the, we take it as, as history. I mean, you can't take a, a, a geometry lesson as history. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm with Achari on all of this stuff, you know, as long as you can't prove that there is a guy, then the burden of proof is on you to find the guy, you know, 
<laughs> but from all of my research, I'm, I just can't find any of these guys or any, or, or any. Neither could anybody in the first century, strangely. <laughs> must have all been, they were on the internet doing podcasts instead yeah. of. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> James, cool. the brother of Jesus here. How can I yeah. help you? So I know, you know, Acharya, I know she was frustrated. I, I spoke with her several times about this. She was concerned about the future generations and, and our generation in particular, where kids today, they don't read books. They're, you know, if it doesn't move like on a screen, then they're not interested. And she felt like her work was in vain. And I just told her, you know, I think history will prove that wrong. You because know, I think we are in uh, Malays, that's for sure. I mean, millennials aren't reading books. And even before that, Batman, I mean, again, none of us are looking at the stars just as important. doesn't exactly. matter how many books we read. We've got to know what's going on up there in the sky. I mean, uh, Derek was talking about Gobleke Tepe. And as uh, Gordon White argues in his book, Starships, it's really fascinating because we assume that when civilization start, it starts, you know, with the kind of Maslow's thing, you know, let's build somewhere yeah. to hunt, let's build shelter. Let's later on, we build the temples and the universities, but Goblega Tepe shows us that it started out with the stargazing building, the temple, which goes back to that thing about Terry Pratchard. It starts with the fantasy. It starts with us looking at the stars and you can say, well, is that the gods? Is that, UFOs downloading information. Was, uh, we, <laughs> as humans, we need those stories in the stars just to exist. We need those fantasies somewhere to look up and inspire us. Like uh, guest Tobias Churton always uh, I asked them one time, uh, why was the 60s the 60s? Was it the drugs? Was it? He said, no, I think once Kennedy said we can go to the moon, everybody lifted their head to the sky and it somehow subconsciously inspired Western civilization that we had the power to go to the stars. That's why we got the music, the art, and the, you know, and of course the, you know, the, the controversies and the culture for better or worse, it changed our consciousness, just like Goblake Tepe shows that humans need to start looking up at the stars. So back to your point, Batman, yes, uh, it's, uh, I'm not as optimistic because again, we're not, younger generations aren't reading and none of us are looking at the stars. So. But, but you know what, they, they might watch podcasts like this, though, because <laughs> it moves on the screen. Well, there you and, go. And it's interesting, you know, yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping that, that, that they will watch stuff like this and learn from history because, you know. I think, I think also looking at the movies, and I know, Luther, you've got something you want to share, but looking at movies, right, a lot of mythology that we do know that are in these books are in movies. Somehow if we can connect them and let them know, just the same way you felt about Iron Man, the same way you felt about the Hulk, the same way you felt about Batman is exactly what the ancients probably thought about Jesus. So they were sacred to them, of course, probably far more than that, though. But go ahead, Luther. I, I, I can see words bubbling out of your temple, like right here out of your head. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think uh, Batman said it best when he started to frame the symbolism going on here. I think one reason why we live in dangerous times is that the ability to tell these kinds of stories are reserved for only certain people and only a certain class. Uh, these stories belong to everyone. And I think everyone in the, in the spirit of ancient learning needs to be able to riff on these stories the way Miguel does in his store, to, uh, in his show, to create your own personal mythology, to at least be able to do that. And, and have a command of the symbols so that creatively you can say something that is meaningful to you and use that as a basis for how you live and how you understand the world and, and react to others. Uh, Batman was talking about the symbolism of Moses coming in and, and about Moses uh, uh, being judgment and representing Libra and, and the sun in Libra. I think that's exactly right. Uh, and I would add to that, that the ancients understood the principle of the dialectic. They understood what was on the opposite side. Yes. And so, and so in Moses, we began to have the sacrificing of sheep. We had, it was a sheep religion. And, and that goes back to Aries the, the ram. 
That's exactly right. And that's on the other side of, of Libra. So yes, we had Libra, which is the judgment of the scales, but we also had him suspended dialectically or diametrically, if you will, on the other side with Aries. And so there is this triangular relationship of, of thesis, antithesis, you know, your Aries, and the antithesis of that would be the Libra. And then the synthesis is how is the human being relating to these opposites? How are we caught in the middle of it? So there's this triangulation. And that triangulation speaks to the three, four, five triangle of Pythagoras, which is very important in how the New Testament framed the 153 uh, numerics, as, as Michelle pointed out. And so these ancients understood the power of the dialectic. They understood that, hey, uh, that opposition is a fundamental principle of life. You're not going to meet everybody who thinks the way you do. Not everybody's going to be the same. The world is not full of your mirror image, okay? And, and when you deal with this uh, fundamental difference or opposition, how does that change our world? What new possibilities does it present? And where do we go from there? And that's something we have lost because we have lost today the ability to, to tolerate, much less appreciate, people who don't think like us. We read all the time about, about people being offended, and so that shuts off the discussion because I'm offended. Whereas the ancients would think that being offended would, should be the beginning point of a discussion. Okay, you're offended, great. Let's proceed from here and hash it out, bring facts to the table, and let's find out why. So I think we, we have lost the dynamic interplay that Batman was talking about, that the stars uh, have told us about. And I think that's, an, that's essential to being human. Yeah, we are... We are story consuming machines mm -hmm. as humans. I mean, whole industries. I mean, look, Hollywood is based on our love for stories. Uh, you know, my wife reads romance novels. You know, these are stories. You know, I, I'm just saying, you know, in the ancient world, do you think they were any different than we are? No, they needed those stories to survive. Simple. I mean, well, exactly. They had to have them, you know, and geez, I mean, S Star Wars is such a cult a classic today that, you know, it's an ocean of myth. It's it, like, is. it is. It is like <laughs> hardcore pressed down <laughs> myth. Into, that and the Empire Strikes Back. And then, then, uh, then I think Return of the Jedi, he lost it. He yeah, lost the yeah, producer yeah. and just <laughs> he never captured it. He stopped, he stopped taking dimethyl tryptamine. I think that's what happened. <laughs> oh, that's right. He lost the psychedelic Come on, connection. Got to plug that Amanita muscaria. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, hey, uh, but, but Derek... Know, yeah, I, Derek, I wanted to say, you know, earlier you were saying how, you know, you wanted to have all the details and, you know, I've hammered you constantly yes. on this, that the nature of, of uh, religious syncretism is that things change all the time throughout history. So you're never going to be able to nail down. The, the real detailed specifics of these things because of that, unless you're going to pick one small slivered area of time and deal only with that. Yeah. Um, I'd and, rather try and get a grand big picture. I mean, you're absolutely right. And I, yeah, it's, it's like changing a tire, a tire on a moving car. It's just not going to happen. And you know, like Acharya said to me, she said, Mark, 80 85 percent of our history has actually been destroyed you know uh and i think intentionally by the church of rome and then it only takes it some new scroll from egypt or archaeological discovery and everything is turned around oh. and everybody's scrambling so yeah and yeah. isn't it interesting miguel that we have you know that we found these star charts and stuff that deal with the zodiac with the the Dead Sea Scrolls, but nobody ever talks about those. No, no, no. But oh, they're part no. of the context. They're part of that finding. And when you put it in context, context, you realize all of this is about the stars. It always has been. Yeah. You know what blew me away when, when you first started talking to me? And I know you guys are fully aware of the great year. I never yeah. realized time. Like we never really sat back and understood how did they understand time. Well, they understood 24-hour days. They understood 365. Enoch lived 365 years. Wouldn't you know it? Well, 
the great year. And that took everything that I thought. And if you aren't aware of what the great year is and you're watching this, just go into YouTube, type in the great year, start searching people, Randall Carlson and others who, you know, will take you through explaining the wobble and going into more detail of what is going on with the great year. But measuring time like that on a grand Zodiac, not just a 12 month Zodiac, that really took me through something biblically that I never had an explanation for, which was the ages, the end of the age that Jesus was talking about, according to the New Testament. These ages that were thousands of years uh, you know, at a time really blew my mind, was like, huh, what's going on with the ages? At least that's the way I was understanding it, was looking at it that way. And something that you said that I thought was great, Miguel, was how... We look at Glebeki Tepe and, and, you know, science is trying to say this is when hunter-gatherers finally become, you know, I, I, I'm very agnostic on that. I, I just can't – because think about it. The earth took a bath not too long before that where the sea levels rose 400 feet. And most of civilization today – look at, like, the United States politics, right – I don't vote, but I look at the chart and I see red and blue. And who do I look at the most? It's California. It's New York. It's Florida. It's, it's along the shore. Let 400 feet of water come back before 12,500, 800 years ago and see how many civilizations were destroyed and wiped out. There's no telling what they knew. We literally hit a reset button and my computer, I just don't know what the hell was in it before it reset. All of it got wiped by this virus called water, and, and something happened, whether, you know, I'm not getting into catastrophes, but nonetheless, something happened. To me, these stories are what lived on. And today, when I talk about recovery, and this is not really part of this program, but when I talk about recovery to people, they always wonder, what God are you offering me? What Jesus? What religion? And I look at them and I say, just listen to my story. All you need to hear is my narrative, and my narrative can be that living myth in you, and if you can hold on to what I'm saying, then I can guarantee you. It's the same thing. What's God in AA? Group of drunks, and all you got to do is have an ear to hear what they're saying, and next thing you know, you're finding yourself further away from that last drink, further away from that last use. That just doesn't go for just recovery. That goes for life as humans. And if we can keep a narrative going and spinning off this narrative, whatever people do with it, which is usually always something like historicity, <laughs> let's get strict and let's hold rules and guidelines and find ways to make people fit in this box. Even people who are in like recovery rooms do that. And instead we stick to a narrative. Narrative's what saves people. So that's my uh, philosophy. Okay. Twists and turns in the stories, uh, guys. Uh, we can look at it conceptually as well as numerologically. And of course, you know, I'm very big on the theological significance and the conceptual significance of numbers. But um, to riff off of what you said, Derek, concerning the great year, as a story progresses, you reach different points on the circle. And they can, they can be measured in a metric expressed by different numbers, but also different concepts. What happens in the story at this point? And then as it goes a little further along the circle and something different will happen. And so it is with the various numbers and concepts that we find in the scriptures. You know, there's uh, the numbers that, that, that we're familiar with that we run into every, every day, uh, like 144, 72, uh, 180, all those are divisions of the great year. So if you look at the largest context of it, you know, like 72, the average lifespan of a man thought of uh, by many in the ancient world is one 360th of the great year. 144, one, one, eight, one, one hundred eightieth of the great year. 180, which is one 144th of the great year. Uh, in fact, I've got a list of that in my previous book. And I list about 20 of these various numbers that you encounter. And they all are divisions of the great year. Derek, can I, Darren, can I, I mean, not uh, Luther, Batman? can I break in here? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, Batman. Yeah. You were just talking about that. 
and I wanted to say, you know, you see like this, these specific numbers like the 144,000 in, in Revelation. And I don't know if anybody remembers in the year, what was it, uh, 2012, remember the uh, the Mayan calendar told us that the end of the world was going to happen. I think it was yep. December 20th, you know, again, winter solstice, right? Okay. And, <laughs> and, and yet, and yet this was uh, after 144 thousand, I think is it either 144, I think it was 144 back tunes. And so why are they using that same specific number? Is it because we all have remnants of that information of those stories that divide the great year? You mm. know, you find that right. num that you find that number four thirty in multiple cultures. You know, right? Uh, and I just think that over time we've lost a lot of that information. Like Derek was saying, our computer hard drives got wiped out, but there was still a remembrance of these things and they're shared culturally across the world. And I just think that's important to, to recognize that, that what you were saying numerologically has been preserved in some of these stories. Well, right. Jo Joseph tells the, ba the wine bearer when he leaves the dungeon, remember me. Jesus says to his followers, do this in remembrance of me. They're trying to keep something <laughs> alive, you know? Remember me, right? We, we think of remember as somehow looking back. That's not what the word says. The word says, make me a member again. The, the word says, reconnect me. Mm -hmm. You can remember your arm. It means put your arm back into your body, son. Remember you. Make you a member again. <laughs> make it an authentic part of you. And I think that's what we've forgotten. So when he's saying, remember me, it means, yeah, I'm a part of you. I'm connected to you now. Recognize the vital connection and maintain it. So, I mean, you know, even, so I, I guess what we're saying is that even words, we, we lose the profundity of the meanings uh, that, uh, that they express. And that's kind of tragic. Maybe we can do our part to restore that. Amen. Miguel. And none of, this, none of this would have been possible, I don't think, these types of discussions without Acharya. Mm -hmm. Her work is, to me, mm -hmm. the authority on astrotheology today. And mythology, uh -uh. too. Let's yeah. So. Dude, she yeah. had mm -hmm. bigger balls than all of us combined. Let's <laughs> yeah. Keep it real. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Let's she did. Let's keep it real. I mean. She, she's amazing. <laughs> Dude, Miguel, thank you, for, thank you for coming and, like, really, like, being here with us, man, it feels natural having you here and like talking about these things. I think we can do this more often if you guys want, like bi-monthly something that's doable and then maybe see if we can incorporate it more because I know a lot of people who are going to like what we're talking about. Every great year. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hell. See you in the next five, six lives. <laughs> right. We'll meet in the spirit world, Miguel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll be robots. We'll have robot parts. Mm -hmm. That's right. The narrative. <laughs> you know, like. The apes will be ruling the world. At that That's time. right. Like there you go. Simpsons. But the Alexandrians knew about it. They know yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be on some spacecraft talking about how our ancient ancestors had this story called Star Wars, and we're not yeah. sure what this is. <laughs> oh, man. No, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, let's do it again. Uh, again, if we can get people to look at the stars and at the same time read these ancient stories, I think humanity has a small chance of making it. So why not? It might be our best yeah. chance. I agree. Batman, Luther, Miguel, you guys are awesome. I just want to say we got to do more of this. And I feel like this was our little Last Supper with Acharya <laughs> yeah. and doing this in remembrance of her. Amen. Thank you. Or as I used Thank to you, tell Acharya. her, Amun Ra. That's right. Amun Ra. Thank you. Thank you. All right.